Good morning. Good morning. Today we'll continue in our lecture series. This is the last lecture in our series. And today we will talk about the initial processes. One way, initial processes are in some way similar to those processes. It is again a non parametric model. And in the case of Gaussian processes, we extend it. But the, we can understand Gaussian processes as an extension, infinite extension of multivariate normal distribution. Dirichlet processes can be understood as infinite extension of Dirichlet distribution. So, let's start more about Dirichlet processes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So, first, we'll start off introducing the Dirichlet distribution, and then, uh, and then we'll go to the Dirichlet process. And extend it in that case. So, so let's start off with the Dirichlet distribution. Well, with the categorical and multinomial distribution. So consider we have a random variable x taking k possible outcomes. So for example, we're tossing a dice. X is the outcome of the dice, and we have six possible outcomes. So among n independent and identical trials and tosses of our dice, we let nj be the counts of the jth outcome. So nj, for j will run, be the number of times we observe one when we roll our dice. Um, and just note that the sample size is the sum of our counts, by definition. So the distribution of xi is given by the categorical distribution. It's parameterized in terms of a vector p, p1 to pk, and um, these are positive and sum to 1, so they are probabilities. And the probability that x is equal to the jth outcome is just pj. Now we can, from, from the categorical distribution, we can derive the distribution on the counts. And the distribution on the counts is given by the multinomial distribution. So this is just pj to the power of the, the counts, nj, the number of times we've seen the jth outcome. And this is the multinomial coefficient here. So if we have n distinct outcomes, this just counts the number of ways I can throw n objects into k fields. Uh, an example is uh, n1 to nk could be the frequency of words in a text. And, and Okay, the Dirichlet distribution is the conjugate prior to the multinomial likelihood. So this just means if we look at the multinomial likelihood as a function of p, it's just proportional to this term here. So if we replace the sufficient statistics with some parameters, we get the Dirichlet distribution. Okay, the Parameters of the Dirichlet distribution are a vector of uh, alpha 1 to alpha k, such that alpha j are all greater than or equal to 0. And we can reparameterize these parameters in terms of alpha, which is called the total mass or the precision parameter. So it's the sum of all of the alphas. And p naught, which is just uh, alpha 1 divided by alpha. So the expected value of pj is just p0j. So we can interpret this parameter p0 as our prior guess. And if we look at the variability of pj, it's given by this formula here. So we can interpret alpha as our precision parameter. It controls the variability. So in particular, as alpha goes to infinity, we have to see that the variance goes to zero, and we converge to our prior guess. OK, here's just some examples of uh, Dirichlet densities taken from Wikipedia. We can see we have uh, different parameters control the mass. This is a, a three, an example of a three-dimensional vector here. So it lies on the uh, k minus 1 simplex. So we have, um, it must lie in this space here. And here's examples of the density for different values of the parameters. <coughs> OK, connections with other distributions. 
if we define zj to be independent gamma, um, independent gamma alpha j, uh, and if I, if I uh, transform these z's appropriately here, then the distribution of this uh, z under this transformation is equivalent to the Dirichlet distribution. So this property is often used to simulate from a uh, Dirichlet distribution. We just take k independent uh, draws from a gamma distribution and we uh, normalize appropriately to get the Dirichlet distribution draws. Um, another uh, connection with another distribution. If I define Vj to be independent beta, where the parameter sets uh, this condition here, for j equal 1 to k minus 1, and the last vk is degenerate at 1, then I can transform these beta random variables, and their distribution under this transformation is equivalent to the, the Dirichlet distribution. So equivalently, I can say that vj is equal to uh, this transformation of p's. So if you're familiar with survival analysis, you'll recognize this as the hazard function. So this is the probability that I die at time j given that I survive up to j. Um, just to note here, uh, we could consider a more flexible parameterization here using alpha j and some general parameter here, beta j and look at the induced distribution on uh, our vector of probabilities. And this is known as the generalized Dirichlet distribution. This is an also conjugate to multinomial likelihood, but it's a more flexible parameterization. Of course, in this case, we lose some properties if we use the generalized Dirichlet distribution because we require an ordering of these uh, random variables. Okay, symmetric Dirichlet distribution. That's just defined where my prior guess has equal mass uh, at each, at each, uh, at each <coughs> So here's some draws from a symmetric Dirichlet distribution with different values of alpha. So here's alpha equal to 0 0.1. We see that in this case, we tend to have high mass on uh, one value and very small mass on all the, on the other values. Instead, as alpha gets larger, our mass tends to, be, to spread out even more. And if we continue, if we look at, say, alpha equal to 100, we would get something very close to our prior guess of, here we have 10 points, so we would have, our prior guess would be uh, 0.1 here. <coughs> and that's because this alpha controls the variability. So we said before that as alpha goes to infinity, we get close to our prior guess. Oops. So we see here that the larger alpha is, the closer we are to the symmetric uh, prior guess. And these samples were drawn uh, based on this property here. Okay, uh, so if we have a, uh, the categorical likelihood, and we use a Dirichlet prior, this leads to a Dirichlet posterior, so we said the Dirichlet is the conjugate, uh, the conjugate prior. Um, this, this is easy to show, right? The posterior of P given X, this is just proportional to our prior on P and our likelihood. As a function of P, this is just proportional to the product from J equal 1 to K, PJ alpha J minus 1, and this is just proportional. J 
enjoy the enjoy. So this just becomes product from J equal one to K. So these are our updated parameters here, the Jewish way. Um, again, we can reparameterize in terms of the uh, total mass or the precision parameter. So we see the precision is increased by n, our sample size. So we are more confident in our updated uh, updated uh, updated mean. And our mean parameter here, well, we can also consider that. So the updated mean parameter is just a mixture between our prior guess and our maximum likelihood guess. And we can show that the predictive distribution, so the probability that the, our, next, uh, our next toss of the dice is equal to j is just our updated mean parameter there. So again, that, that's also easy to show. The probability that xn plus 1 is equal to j, given our sample, that's just the probability xn plus 1 is equal to j, given our vector of probabilities, integrated with respect to the posterior. And this is just PJ. So this is just the expected value of PJ given our data, which is PJ hat. Okay. The Polya Earn scheme describes the distribution of a sequence of random variables, xn, taking values in 1 to k. So we consider an urn with alpha balls, and it has proportion p0j balls of color j for j equal 1 to k. So that means we have alpha times p0j balls of color j. A ball is drawn from the urn and it's replaced with another ball of the same color and we set xn equal to j if the nth ball drawn is a color j. So let's draw a picture to understand that. Okay, so suppose k is just equal to 2. We only have two balls. So let's say we start off with two black balls and three white balls. So in this case, alpha is equal to 5, p0, we can consider 1 to be black and 2 to be white. So p0 of 1 is just 2 over 5, p0 of 2 is just 3 over 5. So what we do is we sample a ball from the urn, say our first straw is black. We put the black ball back in along with another ball of the same color. And we set our first straw equal to black. Now we have alpha plus one balls in the urn, so we have six balls in our urn. We have uh, three black balls and three white balls. We draw another ball from the urn, and we put it back in with another ball of the same color. And we set x2 equal to 2. 
And we keep uh, repeating this. Okay, so the, the law of this, this sequence is given in, by this term here. So the probability that x1 is equal to j, the probability that x1 is equal to j, well, that's just the total number of balls of color j divided by the total number of balls in the urn. The probability that x2 is equal to j, given x1, we can say j2, x1 is equal to j1. This is just equal to the total number of balls in the urn of color j2. So that's alpha p0 j2. Plus, we added one more ball of, of color j2 in this previous step, if j2 is equal to j1. So the indicator that j2 is equal to j1 divided by our total number of balls, which is alpha plus 1, because we added another ball to this stage. And we can keep going. So at stage xn plus 1, given x1 is equal to j1, xn is equal to jn, we have that this is equal to the total number of balls in the urn of color j, which again is alpha times p0j. Let's go, okay, yeah, we're going to keep it j. And then we need the number of balls that we added, which were of color j. So this is just the sum from i equal 1 to n of the indicator that j is equal to j i. And how many balls do we have in the urn at this stage? Alpha plus n. Okay. So that's the law of this sequence. Okay. Exchangeability, exchangeability and deconnectance here. Exchangeability says that if I have a sequence of random variables, so in this case, let's uh, consider that they take values in 1 to k. This sequence of random variables is exchangeable. If I take any permutation of the set 1 to n, so pi is any permutation of this set, uh, then the distribution of these vectors satisfies this equality here. So I can permute the order of my random variables, and the law stays the same. So I don't actually care that x1 is equal to j1, x2 is equal to j2. I just care that one of my one of my variables is equal to j1, one of my variables is equal to j2, and so on. So DeConnecti theorem says that if a sequence of random variables is exchangeable, or a sequence of random variables taking values in our discrete space is exchangeable if and only if there exists a unique probability measure Q on our simplex such that uh, this holds here. So this says that Exchangeability is equivalent to saying that Xi given P, our IID, uh, in this case categorical with parameter P, and P has distribution Q. So if I believe my data are exchangeable, then I know that this holds. If this holds, then I'm assuming my data are exchangeable.
Okay. So we can show that if the, dis, uh, the distribution of Xn is described by the polya urn scheme, then our data is exchangeable. So that's, that's quite easy to show. Uh, we can go through the proof real quick. So let's Let's look at this <coughs> distribution for the poly Aaron sequence. So we have, it's given by this here. So we have alpha over P0 J1 over alpha, the number of balls of J, color J1 over the total number of balls, alpha over P0 J2 plus the indicator that J2 is equal to J1 over alpha plus 1, and so on. Then at the end, we have alpha P0 Jn plus the sum from I equal 1 to N minus 1 of the indicator that Jn is equal to Ji over alpha plus N minus 1. So this is the distribution of our first n elements from the polyamorin scheme. Okay, so let's rewrite this a bit. Look at this denominator here. This is just the falling vectorial. So we can say that, just rewriting this denominator term, this is gamma of alpha, gamma of alpha plus n. Okay, now let's look at the top. So suppose I have nj, nj of, n, so nj is the count of ji equal to j in this sequence here. So we see that the first time that j is drawn from the urn, we will only have alpha of p0 j balls. The second time it's drawn, we'll have alpha of alpha times p0 j. The second time is drawn, we'll have alpha of p0 j plus 1, and so on until we have alpha, until we take the last draw, then we have nj minus 1. And you can do this for j equal 1 to k. So we can rewrite this numerator here as, a, as another falling factorial. So we have the product from j equal 1 to k, gamma of alpha, Okay, and this only depends on these counts here. It doesn't depend on the order in which I saw the variables. Uh, the order in which I saw these. So it's exchangeable. So from DiFanetti's theorem, we know that this folds here. So we know that this is equal to the integral so that's what Dependentist theorem tells us and this uh, just gives the moments of the Dirichlet distribution so we know that Q must be the Dirichlet distribution Okay. Conversely, we know that if x, i, given p, have categorical distribution. So what we just showed is that if xn is a sequence of, the distribution of xn is described by the poly urn scheme, then they're exchangeable, and this definite measure is the Dirichlet distribution. 
Conversely, we can show that if xi given p have a categorical distribution, p is uh, Dirichlet, then the distribution, the predictive distribution of the marginal distribution of our sequence of random variables is the Pauli Ernst That just follows from the predictive distribution here. So that we have this if and only if state, statement here. If the distribution of Xn is described by the Pauli Ernst scheme, the distribution of Xn is described by the Pauli Ernst scheme if and only if this model holds here. Okay, so now let's move on to the Dirichlet process. The Dirichlet process is an extension of the Dirichlet distribution on the space of probability. So the Dirichlet distribution is a distribution on the space of probability measures on the, our finite space. We can see it as a distribution on the space of probability measures on our finite space. So now we're extending this to a distribution on the set of probability measures on a complete and separable metric space. So let's clarify this <coughs> idea a bit more. Erase this. Okay. So the Dirichlet distribution defines a prior or a distribution on the set of probability measures on space 1 to k. So we really defined it on the vector, uh, the, the probability mass on each of these points. But since it's finite, we can derive the distribution on any set uh, composed of these elements. So we can see it as a, a distribution on the set of probability measures. So just to, to clarify what this space is, this is the space of functions p from the sigma algebra on our space. 1 to k. So in this case, it's just the power set, the set of all possible sets. And it maps it to the unit interval. So it takes a set of elements, a subset of this space, and it maps it onto the unit interval. And it must additionally satisfy two other properties. The first is that the measure of the entire space is equal to 1, and it must be countably additive. So if I take any sets in my sigma algebra, any countable number of sets, then the probability of the union is just equal to the sum of the, oh, sorry, this is for disjoint sets. Okay, so now we want to extend this, just replacing, decreasing the, the set, our finite set with a general space X. So the Dirichlet process defines a prior on probability measures on a general space, which we'll call script X. So this space, again, is the set of probability measures. Here we'll take the or else sigma algebra. So x is a complete inseparable metric space, and this is just the sigma algebra generated by all open balls defined by your metric on x. So it maps this to the unit interval, so it takes some set, 
maps it to the unit integral, and it must satisfy the same two properties. So the measure of the whole set must be 1. Here we just replace this with x. And it must be countably additive. OK. <laughs> Um, we need some additional notation, so I'm using this script px to denote this space here, this set of probability measures um, on x. And we need to define a prior on this space. We need a sigma algebra on this space. Um, so we'll use the, consider the Borel sigma algebra under weak convergence. So weak convergence is a metric we can use in the space of probability measures. And the Borel sigma algebra is the algebra, sigma algebra generated by all the boom balls under this metric. OK. So now to the definition of the Dirichlet process prior. It has two parameters, alpha, which is just a positive scalar. And our base measure, P0, which is just a probability measure on X. <coughs> uh, we say that P has a Dirichlet process prior. We denote it with these two parameters. We denote it with this notation here. If for any finite measurable partition of our space X, uh, the distribution of this, this vector has a Dirichlet distribution with consistent parameters here. Okay, so this is the definition of the Dirichlet process prior. It has two parameters, as I said before, the base measure, which is the prior guess, and the precision parameter. So we still have uh, the, the, the variance of the probability measure of any set is given by this here. So we see that alpha, again, controls the variability. So as alpha goes to infinity, we converge to our prior guess. The Dirichlet process prior converges to a point mass at our prior guess. OK, let's go back to the Dirichlet distribution and look at an uh, important property of the Dirichlet distribution, which lets us define this uh, non-parametric prior. So if we consider B1 to Bn to be any finite partition of this, uh, of our space, 1 to K, we define the probability of Bi to just be the sum of the probability mass of the points which are in Bi. Then uh, from properties of the Dirichlet distribution, uh, we know that the probability of these points is, uh, uh, at these sets is also a Dirichlet distribution uh, with parameters appropriately defined. So what this means is that, let's go back. So what we did here was we just defined, as, what we, as we did for the Gaussian process, we're just defining a collection of marginals. So for the Gaussian process, we defined a collection of marginals, the distribution of the fu function at n points. So here we're just defining the collection of marginals, the distribution of the probability measure at some finite uh, number of sets. And we have that this marginal property holds. So if I consider a1, a um, K, let's say, where this these sets is a is a finer is a finer partition of of our space X. So it's a finer partition of V one. <laughs> so each A I each A I must lie in one of these sets. That's a finer partition. Then, if I look at the distribution of P1, of B1, Vm, of the probability of these sets, this is equal in distribution 
to the sum over i such that a i is in p one p of a i sum over i such that a i is in p n p of a i so these two are equal in distribution because of this marginalization property here. So we have that the Dirichlet distribution marginalizes appropriately, and we can show that a uh, process exists with these marginals. Um, so the, the proof of existence, I, I'm, I'm not going to present that. Uh, you, you could simply just apply the Komogorov uh, extension theorem. However, the Komogorov extension theorem would say that there exists a, a, a process on this space without these two conditions here. So just on functions which go from, take sets and map it into the 0, 1 interval. So we can't, and so we could restrict our prior to the desirable set that we want here. So we want our functions also to satisfy these two properties. However, this is not a measurable subset of this space without these two conditions. So we can't simply uh, apply Kolmogorov extension theorem. So the proof is a bit more involved. Um, I can give you the appropriate reference if you're interested in seeing. Okay, so now let's go to the stick breaking construction. So P has a Dirichlet process prior with parameters alpha and P0. Then it is characterized by this stick breaking construction here. So it's, um, you have point masses at some parameters theta j, which are sampled from our base measure. And these have uh, weights defined here. Okay. So consider we have a stick of length one. So this is why this is called the stick breaking construction. We have a stick of length one. At the first step, we take v, uh, v1, which is a beta random variable, with parameters one alpha. So this tells us the proportion of stick of the stick that I break off at time one. So at time one. I break off this proportion of the stick and I set P1 P1 equal to V1. Now I have <coughs> this much of the stick left over, it has like 1 minus V1. At step two, I break off another piece of this stick. The proportion that I break off is V2, which is another beta random variable, independent. So I break off another piece. And the length of this stick is the proportion that I break off times the length of the total stick. So P2 is equal to V2 times 1 minus one. So now I have a stick of like 1 minus V2 times 1 minus V1 left. And I repeat this procedure again. I take another proportion of the stick, which has which is V3. So this length of, of this piece now is V3, 1 minus V1. 1 minus 
And I keep repeating this. Repeating this procedure. Okay, so this is the stick breaking construction of the Dirichlet process prior. So notice that this means that a sample from the Dirichlet process prior will be discrete with probability one. Okay. So here's some samples from a Dirichlet process prior. I used this stick breaking representation to sample from the Dirichlet process prior. So I uh, I kept sampling these BJs and, and repeating the P's until they, the, uh, so you'll notice that this, the weights tend to decrease, so the, the, the proportion of the stick remaining gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so I kept sampling until my computer told me that what I had left was basically, was zero. So the computer can detect any more the, the, the leftover maps. Okay, so here are some random draws with different values of alpha. My base measure, I just set it to be standard normal. So here I took a quite small uh, mass parameter equal to 0 0.01. And you can see that I basically get all my mass at one point. So this proportion of the stick, if alpha is large, this is beta. So this is beta 1 alpha. If alpha is large, this thing, this will be large, and the proportion of the stick over it uh, will be quite large. Instead, as alpha gets larger, we see that we have more and more uh, samples with smaller mass. And as alpha goes to infinity, we converge to our prior guess, or base measure. But if, if you do this, you can do it infinitely, right? If you can always theoretically break mm -hmm. and you will never get uh, to zero, right? Yeah, theoretically you'll never get to zero. In practice, it's it's so small that your, your computer tells you it's yeah. zero. But, okay. Yeah, so I, here I have, let's see, for this one I guess I have one, two, three, four, five, six points. So I already at six points. He said what was left over is very, very small. So in theory, I should have an infinite number of mass points plotted here. But they're, they're, the mass is just so small that I. Might. But what would, it be, what would it be when the. Base measure is a big Gaussian. It, it's uncountably infinite, and you will have countably infinite samples, or also uncountably infinite. What will your draw be? No, this is this is the. So I will have. I will always have a countably, a countable number, infinitely countable number of. Uh, uh, Point masses at some parameters which are stable from our base from my base measure. That's the characterization of the Dirichlet process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if I if my model is that x i given p or i i d p and I put a Dirichlet process prior on P, then I have a Dirichlet process posterior with updated parameters. So the Dirichlet process is the conjugate prior. Uh, my updated parameters are again, I increase my uh, precision parameter by N, so I'm more confident now in my mean parameter here, which again, we can just write this as a mixture of my prior guess and the uh, empirical distribution function, or empirical probability function. Okay, and the predictive distribution is just p hat 
Okay. So the predictive distribution, again, it's just the mixture of our prior guess and the empirical. Okay, now let's introduce the Blackwell and McQueen Ernst scheme. Okay, so I think I will go straight to the picture to explain this. Okay. So we start off with an urn with alpha black balls. So the black balls are uh, special balls. Okay. So at step one, I draw a ball from the urn. I only have black balls on my urn, so I have to draw a black ball. So once I draw the black ball, it reveals its color to me. It has some color, which is drawn from my base measure, so say it's uh, stripes. So I put the stripe ball back in the urn. With another, with, and, I, and I put another black ball in there, so I still have five black balls. And then I set x1 equal to theta1 star. Now, at the next step, I have five black balls still, but now I have one stripe ball. So I can. Uh, Draw another ball from the air. So let's say this time that I draw the striped ball. So I draw the striped ball. I draw the striped ball. I put it back in with another striped ball. And I set x2 equal to theta 1 star, which is the color of it's equal to stripes in this case. Okay, at the next step, let's say I draw a black ball. So I draw a black ball and it tells me my color theta 2 star. So it's dots. And I put this, I put the black ball back in and I put a ball with dots. So x3 is equal to theta 2 star. And you keep repeating this, uh, this process. So just at Kn, this will be the, uh, this will be at stage n, this is the, <coughs> Kn is the number of, uh, of the, the number of color balls I have. So at this stage, at stage three, I have Kn is equal to two. Kn denotes the number of black balls drawn among the first n draws. So formally, the law of this sequence is given by this, this formula here. So it's very similar to the Pauli Ern scheme. The probability that the color of x is in some set B is just equal to the, well, at stage one, I have to draw a black ball. And the probability that my realized color is in the set B is just the prior, I mean, the, our base measure, the mass that assigns to that, that set of colors. At stage N, I now have alpha plus N balls in my urn. And the probability that I, my next sample is in the set B is just, well, if I draw a black ball, again, my realized color will be in the set B with the prior, with our base measure, the mass of the base measure at B. Or if any of my colors that I put back into the air are in the set B. So that's the number of previous 
samples where the samples are in some set B. Okay, so this is the general statement for exchangeability for on a general space. It's very similar. So now this is saying that the sequence of random variables is exchangeable if I take any permutation of the random variables, the law is the same. So I don't care whether x1 is in b1, I just care that one of my random variables is in b1, one of my random variables is in b2, and so on. So again, we have this, a sequence of random variables is exchangeable if and only if there exists a unique probability measure of q. Now q is a probability measure on a set of all probability measures in our uh, space x. And where this, this holds here. So this says, again, exchangeability is equivalent to saying that xi given p are i and z with probability measure p, and p has some distribution q. So these two things are equivalent. So if I use this model, I'm saying that my data are exchangeable. If my data are exchangeable, then if I believe my data are exchangeable, then uh, this is the model of my data. OK. So Black and Well McQueen in 1973 showed that if the distribution of Xn is described by the Polya Ern, uh, by the Blackwell McQueen Ern scheme, then the Finetti measure is the Dirichlet process, and this is an if and only if. So if you want to see the proof of this, you can check out their their paper. I think it's only three pages long, but I, I won't be going through the proof here. Okay, uh, so the clustering given by the uh, given by the Dirichlet process. Uh, so since P is discrete, almost surely there is a positive probability of ties among our sample. So we have a clustering of our uh, of our samples. So we can re uh, well. Okay, let's let K and the the number of unique values in our sample, theta 1 star to k, theta, uh, theta star kn is the unique values, nj is the cluster sizes, so it's the number of samples equal to the j of the unique value. Assuming that our uh, base measure is not atomic, that means it's uh, it's not, it doesn't have a point mass at any, at any uh, x in our uh, space script x. Then from the poly Ern scheme, we can rewrite the poly Ern scheme in this, uh, in this setting here. So this just says my first sample is, uh, is the unique value. Given uh, my samples x1 to xn, the next value is either going to be a new value sampled from the base measure with probability alpha over alpha plus n, or it's going to be one of my previously observed unique values with probability nj over alpha plus n, and my unique values are just sampled from the base measure. So the our sample x1 to xn, it can be reparameterized in terms of the unique values these unique values, and uh, the random partition. So this are the labels which tell me uh, which cluster each subject is in. So si is equal to j if the i subject is in the j cluster. So if I know the partition and I know the unique values, I know the values of x, right? And conversely, if I know x, I know the unique values and I know the labels of each subject. So if I just look at the predicted distribution of these labels, this is known as the Chinese restaurant process. So let's just say what the Chinese restaurant process is.
<laughs> so the Chinese restaurant process to say say S one S N is equal to one two one one uh, three two seven. So we have six subjects. Chinese restaurant process says, so this is table one. The first customer comes in. So it's S1. He comes in and he sits at the first table here. So S1 sits at the first table. The second customer comes in. So now S2 comes in. And he'll either sit at the first table with the probability of four to one, the number of subjects sitting at that table. So that's just one in this case. Or he sits at a new table with probability proportional to alpha. So here, at this stage, we have one person at this table. So he'll sit at this table with probability n1, or just one over alpha plus one. He'll sit at the new table with probability alpha. One. So he decides to sit at the new table. So S2 is here. Now we have our third subject that comes in. So now let's update the probabilities. We have one person at table one, one person at table two, and we possibly have a new table, table three. So now this, the probability he sits at this table is proportional to 1. The probability that he sits at this table is proportional to 1. We have to renormalize appropriately. So that's 2. This is alpha over alpha plus 2. And he says, I want to sit at this table. Oops, that's a string. Okay, and then the next subject comes in. He decides to sit at this table. The probability that he sits at each of these tables, we can update it. So then before there was two subjects now at this table. And we can update our probabilities perfectly. Uh, Okay, so we can keep going. The, the, the fifth subject, he decides to sit at table three. This is with probability proportional to alpha. He would have sat at this table with probability proportional to one. He would have sat at this table with probability proportional to three. The number of subjects there. And finally, we have the last subject, which sits at uh, this. Okay, so that's the Chinese restaurant process. So now if we color these tables with colors uh, sampled from our base measure, so we color this table with theta 1 star sampled from P0. So now this table is, has color theta 1 star. This color has theta 2 star, which is independently sampled from my base measure. And this table is colored with data three star. Then we have the Dirichlet, the predictive distribution of the Dirichlet process. So if we color the tables of the Chinese restaurant process, we have the predictive distribution of the Dirichlet process. Okay, so. The most popular application of Dirichlet processes is to mixture models. So we said that the Dirichlet process is discrete with probability 1. And in many applications, uh, this we don't want a discrete probability measure. So one way to overcome this is to convolute the Dirichlet process with a continuous so some parametric density. Then we get a probability that we get a, 
a prior on the space of uh, densities or probability measures which are continuous almost surely. Okay, so here is the definition of mixture models. We just say that the density of X given P is just a mixture of some parametric densities with parameter theta, and P here is the mixing measure over theta. So one example, we could consider a mixture of normals. In that case, theta would be the, the mean and or it could be the, just the mean, then we would call this a location mixture of normals. Or it could be the mean and the variance, then we call this a location scale mixture of normals. So in a Bayesian setting, we need to put a prior on P. And the common choice is the Dirichlet process prior. Since uh, P is discrete with probability 1, we can represent this as a infinitely countable mixture of our parametric kernels. Okay, so here's some samples from the Dirichlet process mixture. So this is a Dirichlet process location scale mixture of normals. So my kernel here is a normal. And theta is equal to the mean and the variance. So this is the base measure I chose for, for the Dirichlet process. It's just the conjugate prior, so it's the normal inverse gamma. I fixed the mean of my base measure to zero, the parameters of the inverse gamma, one, one. And here's our, here are samples with different values of alpha, the precision parameter of the DP, and C, this uh, here at the normal inverse gamma. So you can see that for different values of alpha and C, we can get um, various different types of densities sampled from our prior. Uh, we see that, so this, in this case, we have a small value of alpha, C is equal to 1. So we have very few components with uh, mass, which is which is relevant, which is uh, bigger than uh, zero, effectively. And C is equal to one, which means that these means are not, the means of these, these two components which are mixed are not very far apart. Instead, if I increase C but keep the same alpha, I still have roughly only a mixture of two components. Uh, but Increasing C allows the mean, the sample means to be more spread out here. So I get something that looks a bit more bumpy. If I increase alpha, then I get uh, more components with uh, mass, which is bigger, much bigger than zero. So I have more relevant components in my mixture. Again, C is equal to one, so the Sample means aren't very spread out. They're quite close to zero. So if I increase C, I get uh, samples which are more spread out. And alpha equal to 10, we have many more components now in our mixture. And if we increase C, we can see that we get something more spread out. So this blue line is the, uh, the sample, and these dashed lines are the different components. Okay, inference in Dirichlet process mixture models. So we can, so this was how we defined the mixture model before, and then we put a prior on P. So we can <coughs> rewrite this equivalently, introducing these latent parameters theta i. So xi given theta i just has this uh, parametric density, theta i, given p, or i draws from p, and p has a Dirichlet process prior. So marginal MCMC methods, they're based on the idea of marginalizing out p. So I can marginalize out p, and then I know that marginally, 
the distribution of theta i is just described by the black hole and queen Ernstein. So then they just carry out posterior inference on these theta 1 to theta n given x. And this is just based on a given sampling algorithm and the Ernst scheme characterization. So other methods, which instead uh, are based directly on this model, so without, without integrating out p, are the truncation method, which basically truncates this infinity to j, and then I can carry out posterior inference for all my parameters. There's also slice sampling, which introduces a uh, latent variable here to deal with this infinite sum, and retrospective sampling, which is uh, very similar to slice sampling. Okay, um, so let's see how the Gibbs sampling algorithm looks like for the marginal MCMC methods. Okay, so we first, we said we're going to integrate out P, and we're just, in, we're just interested in the, so we're integrating out P, and what, what we're interested in, our target is to obtain this year inference on theta 1, theta n, given my data. So that's, that's our target. Okay, so our first step is just to rewrite this sample in terms of the labels and the unique values. So that's the, the first step. So I rewrite this as and my unique values. Okay, uh, just to shorten some notation, but I'll call this as in this data star. So the algorithm proceeds by first, uh, so step one, well, step zero is to initialize us and data star. So initialize here. Step one, which is really step one to n. It's to sample SI given the labels of everybody else, uh, the unique values, and the data. So I call this step one, but this is really n steps because we're sampling each label from its full conditional. Okay, so this is just proportional to, so the probability that subject I is in the J cluster, we know from the Ern scheme that it's in a new cluster with probability proportional to alpha times, so we can write this out, this is the probability that SI is equal to J, given S9 size, so the labels of everybody else, the parameters in S. This is just proportional to the probability that SI is equal to J, given the labels of everybody else, and the likelihood of X, I, given the labels of given all of the labels, so S and the data star. Okay, so if, if he wants to be in one of the old components, that's this line, that's this thing, you know, J is in uh, 1 to Kn minus I. So this here should say Kn minus i here. So this is the number of unique values with the i subject removed. And similarly here, this should be 
and j minus i. So this is just proportional to the number of subjects equal to the j unique value with the i person removed. And this is just our model for x i with the parameter theta j plugged in. So we have this line here. Instead, if he wants to be in a new, if he wants to be equal to a new one, this probability here is proportional to alpha, and this thing here is xi. Well, it would be given theta star k n minus i plus 1, but we don't know this value, so we have to integrate this with respect to the base measure. Okay, so that's this line here. Okay, so that's step one. Can I ask uh, sure. the second term in the product? Uh, you have s, is it also s minus i or not? Uh, no, so this is, so this is, we can see this as the prior sense, so the probability of s i given j times x to the likelihood, so x given everything else. Okay. So this is also given, this is s the, minus the i and s i, so yes, yeah, the whole s there. Yeah, so you can kind of see this as the prior times the later. And this actually only depends on i, so we can just write as i. Okay, so the second the second step would be step n plus one, whatever you see, is to sample the unique values given the data and the labels. So if you write out, this is the full conditional of the unique values, you see that this factorizes just into the product of the unique values given the data for subjects in the J cluster. So this means that these unique values given, given these parameters can just be sampled independently. Okay, so the posterior of the J unique value given the data for subjects in the J cluster, that's just proportional to the prior, to the base measure, times the, uh, the parametric model for subjects in the J cluster. So if this is the conjugate prior, so if this is uh, normal here. Uh, so if the model is, say, what we had before, <coughs> the normal and theta is equal to the mean and the variance, and this is just a product of normals. And if we put the normal inverse gamma prior here for P0, we get the usual updates. Sample those. So these theta j's would just be samples from a normal inverse gamma with updated parameters. I ask in the first step where you say you sample SIs. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you sample just uh, a single SI for each? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a separate step. So this so you have to sample each SI from its full conditional. Um, so, yeah, you can see here, so instead for here, we're updating them, say, jointly, because we're given these parameters that the J stars are uh, independent, so we can consider that as a joint update, whereas here we're updating these labels one at a time, so this can result in kind of in slug mixing here, since we're, we have to update each one one at a time. Um, so that's... That's a drawback of these marginal MCMC methods that we have to sample these labels 
uh, each label from its full conditional one step at a time. Whereas in these other methods where we don't integrate out P, we can usually sample. We also have to introduce these labels, and these labels conditioned on everything else, they are uh, conditionally independent in that case. Um, so uh, sometimes these methods, they can result in better mixing. Um, but they're a bit more complicated. So for the lectures, I'm just presenting the marginal MCMC methods. OK. All right, so we have just a few minutes left, so let's introduce the notion of dependent Dirichlet process priors. So dependent Dirichlet process priors define a distribution over a collection of random probability measures. So now instead of a single P, I have Px for x in some space x, and I want to define a prior on this collection of random probability measures such that they are dependent and marginally that it, each one is a Dirichlet process. Um, yeah. This, this constraint is often, so sometimes people don't really care that marginally it's a Dirichlet process. Uh, so here's two examples. So if x is discrete and categorical, so script x, so script x is just one and uh, two examples of defining dependent Dirichlet process priors are the hierarchical Dirichlet process. So that assumes that, so now I want to define a prior on P1 to Pn. So, so now I have n random measures. And I want to define a prior on this collection of random probability measures. So the hierarchical Dirichlet process assumes that P M given P are I D D P alpha P and P is a Dirichlet process. So they just put a Dirichlet process prior on the base measure to link these random, M random probability measures. Okay, so let's let's consider an example here. So this I'll erase this because it's just. Okay, suppose that we have uh, three documents then. So P1, P2, P3. These just describe the distribution of words in each document. So suppose we have some words, each has counts. Yeah. Infinite number of words. We want to put a prior on the uh, on the distribution of words in each document, such that these distributions are dependent. So the Dirichlet, the hierarchical Dirichlet process, what that says is, well, I have a base measure p which is a Dirichlet process. So from the stick breaking construction, we know that it can be represented in this way here. So each of these P1s will be sampled, so what will be a Dirichlet process with this space measure here.
So what you see is that these are samples from a Dirichlet process with this base measure. So these, uh, these probability measures will share the same atoms, but they will have different counts. So that means I'll see the same words in these documents, but with different counts. OK, another example is the nested Dirichlet process. Um, so this notation can be a bit confusing. So let's, let's write it out here. So instead, what the nested Dirichlet process assumes is that so PM given Q or IID Q and Q has this uh, strange distribution there. Okay, so what you can see is that Q now This notation here, you can rewrite it as saying that Q has this form here, so it's a Dirichlet process, but now the, the atoms are actually random probability measures. So these atoms are independent IID samples from a DP uh, beta P0. So in, in our samples, what we'll see is that if I take a sample from this Q, I'll either have two probability measures, which are, they're either exactly alike or they're completely different. Do you see that? If I take a sample from here, I get P, P1 star with probability of P1 P2 star probability P1. So let's say that P1 is, uh, well, again, you'll have the same, the same form. Uh, but these, these can be exactly. Okay. And say P3 is uh, different. Okay, so this means here that in my sample I'll have uh, very similar words with very similar counts, and this document will have completely different words with completely different counts. So these are just two examples. And the final example that I will discuss is the dependent Dirichlet process defined by McEachern in 1999. Um, so in this case, it's easier to think that X is continuous. So he defines these, this class of dependent Dirichlet processes by just, so we said that the, there's just a breaking, uh, uh, here we go. So the Dirichlet process is characterized by, uh, by this, this, uh, this construction here. So the dependent Dirichlet, to, to make this P depend on X, all he does is he makes these weights depend on X and the atoms depend on X. Okay, here we go. So the weights depend on X and the atoms depend on X. And now I need to define a law for these, uh, these atoms, which are functions of X. So for example, we can say that theta j x are, so they are independent over j, and they can be, uh, have a Gaussian process prior. So we have a mixture of Gaussian processes. Okay, and the weights, 
they can be defined, well, there are several ways to define the weights. One way is to just use the stick breaking construction, but replace those beta random variables with, uh, with uh, stochastic processes which depend on x, such that marginal and beta are beta. We need this in order for them to be uh, used to be marginally uh, Dirichlet process. Dirichlet processes. Okay, so in practice, though, often you you only assume one of these two options. So you either assume that you have flexible weights and these atoms don't depend on x, or you have or, or these these weights don't depend on x and you have flexible atoms. And this is because uh, you. Uh, the, the model is still very flexible. Either way, you can approximate almost any uh, collection of distribution functions um, with the simplification. So it eases computation costs. Sure. A little bit of example of the Gaussian process. I mean, the, what would be, for example, the covariance matrix like? Uh, you can yeah. use anything that you want. So here, let's let's see an example of how this would be used. Maybe that'll help. Okay. So. In this case, um, we could say y given x, y i given x i, and mu x i is normal mu x i sigma squared mu i given P X R I R D P X and P X R has a dependent Dirichlet process prior. So we say you can say P X we'll just simplify and say the A's don't depend on X. And we have mu J X star and these mu j x star for each j they are independent or i r d Gaussian processes with uh, whatever with say mean zero and whatever covariance function we want. So we can rewrite this a bit and we, that, that means that the density f of y given x and px is the sum from j equal 1 to p of pj normal mu j star of x varies sigma squared. So we have a mixture of uh, our Gaussian process models. Infinite uh, mixture. So what, what does that mean? We draw a picture. Say so we have one Gaussian process here with some noise around it. Another Gaussian process here, another Gaussian process here. We take the average. So we get something where the mean function is flexible, but we can also have flexible error distribution around that mean. 